Yes, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in uh, and joining us today for Fish and Richardson's webinar. My name is Gwillem Atwell, and today my colleague Mike Amon and I will present Biologics Litigation and IPRs. Today's webinar will run for about one hour, uh, although you can post questions at any time throughout the program by clicking on the Q&A icon towards the bottom of your screen. Uh, due to time constraints, uh, we likely won't be able to answer many of the questions uh, today, but uh, we will follow up with every question uh, via email. Also, please feel free to call or email us directly with any questions. Before we get started, uh, I should remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is not intended to address every court or case situation. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to move on to the first slide, uh, which really is uh, a little summary of everything going on. Uh, this is one in a series of presentations in the biosimilars area. Uh, Mike Amon is going to discuss some of those previous uh, sessions uh, in just a minute. Uh, for CLE purposes, uh, you should receive CLE credit for today's presentation. We will be giving you a code uh, for New York CLE purposes during the presentation. If you have uh, questions or issues with getting CLE, please feel free to contact my colleague Jane Lundberg uh, who can help you uh, with those issues. Also, today's webinar will be available online. You can see, uh, you can see the link there, uh, fr.com slash industries. Also, uh, we have a, a, a Twitter feed as well as every other social media you can imagine, so please, uh, please follow us. And finally, before we start with the substantive presentation, uh, if you're in the Bay Area and are interested, we have a Life Sciences IP Summit on November 3rd in Redwood City. Please contact me if you'd like information. So uh, now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to my colleague, Mike Amon, who's going to uh, give some background on some previous webinars and then kick off the presentation. Mike? Thanks, Willem. Uh Good morning to everybody in the West and good afternoon to everybody who's joining us uh, on the, in the eastern part of the country. Uh, this webinar is a continuation of our ongoing series related to biosimilars. Uh, we've had four previous biosimilars, uh, as you can see listed on the slide. The first one, Biosimilars 101, is a detailed discussion of the BPCIA, including uh, an in-depth uh, analysis of the patent dance. Uh, Biosimilars 102 uh, is a discussion of litigation planning and strategy, including an analysis of those factors that should be considered as to whether to dance or not, that is, participate in the BPCIA patent dance or not. Uh, the third in the series is uh, biosimilars and IPR that discusses strategy, including some of the challenges and benefits of proceeding to challenge biologic patents through the IPR process. And then the fourth installment uh, in our series is a survey discussion of biosimilars litigation to date that addresses uh, all of the uh, litigation that has gone on that, at, to that point. Um, we encourage you all to visit our website uh, and the link that was found on the previous slide uh, where you can have access to all those information uh, and all those presentations to the extent that you want more, a more detailed discussion of any particular issue. Now, this presentation uh, will not be a deep dive into the statutes or the cases. We've done that before, that, that information is already available. This is going to be more of an update uh, of where we stand right now and the questions that are most pressing in the biosimilars arena. Um, to give folks uh, and to frame our discussion, I want to give an overview of the BPCIA. Um, so first, the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act, BPCIA, was passed as part of the Affordable Care Act and signed into law in March of 2010. The BPCIA creates an abbreviated licensure pathway for biologic products shown to be biosimilar or interchangeable 
with an FDA licensed reference product. That is what in Hatch-Waxman terms would be called the, the branded product. Uh, we'll refer to the reference product as the RPS. Uh, and generally the biosimilar applicant is just biosimilars for purposes of our discussion. And currently the courts and the FDA are tackling really uncharted legal and regulatory issues surrounding implementation. Now, as I'm sure many of you are aware, and we can see, uh, we'll see in a couple of slides, um, the BPCIA is a very complicated statutory scheme. Uh, for many parts of it, there is little uh, legislative history. And in fact, for some provisions, there is no legislative history. That is, there is no discussion of how the laws were written, the negotiation that went back and forth in Congress at arriving in the, in the way the statute was written. Litigation in this area has just begun. And by analogy, we are in the same place that Hatch-Waxman was, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, that is, we're in a nascent litigation world, uh, nascent regulatory interpretation world, um, and we're going to see what's going to come forward. The impact is substantial because, realistically, there is a great deal of money at stake here. Uh, in some ways, the stakes are higher than it is in the Hatch-Waxman world. Uh, and the, the reason I say that, uh, for example, it's quite expensive uh, to develop a biosimilar and get it to market. In contrast to the Hatch-Waxman, where it's relatively inexpensive to prepare an ANDA and develop a generic drug, biosimilars uh, and the BPCIA require some level of clinical testing, um, which increases the cost associated with developing a biosimilar product. Um, right now, there is no guarantee of market share for a biosimilar that launches, given the fact that there are limited substitution laws, and though to the extent that they're present, it's only in a few states. And at least from what we've seen so far, there isn't a, a large price drop when biosimilars do launch. Uh, in addition, uh, adding to the cost of biosimilars is the fact that biosimilars are going to have to market their products, which is different from the small molecule Hatch-Waxman world where uh, ANDAs would essentially provide their customers, clients, being the pharmacies, a, a price list and didn't have to do any active marketing. That is going to be different. Uh, at least we anticipate that's going to be different in the biosimilars arena. Uh, and then complicating factors in this particular area uh, is that uh, this is not a, there's not a clear divide among the parties here. It isn't a branded versus generic market. Uh, you have large pharmaceutical companies on both sides of the fence. For example, Amgen is well healed, and they will be able to invest substantial resources and bring substantial resources to bear on getting their biosimilars to market. So uh, the 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 playing field is a little bit different than in the Hatch-Waxman world. Um, with that broad discussion, uh, I want to discuss some past litigation in the biosimilars world. And, and we're just going to try to briefly discuss some of the aspects here. First is the Sandoz v. Amgen case. Um, and this is one of the first cases that, that had some litigation. Um, it was a case uh, related to Embril. And it was a situation where Sandoz was conducting phase three testing for its biosimilar uh, and was intending to file an application for biologic approval, the ABLA. Uh, but it had not done that when it filed the lawsuit. Uh, Sandoz wanted to get some clarity on, as to the patent landscape and filed a DJ action. Uh, seeking a, a judgment that the, bio, that the biosimilar did not infringe certain Amgen patents and, and that those patents were invalid. Uh, the district court there dismissed for lack of case or controversy because there was no, and because there was no statutory authority to file a DJ action. 
the Federal Circuit affirmed finding that there was no case or controversy because there was no immediate threat to Sandoz. The Federal Circuit there did not uh, address the question of whether there was statutory authority under the PPCIA because Sandoz had, yet, had not yet filed its ABLA, uh, and therefore it, didn't need, it, it found that it didn't need to reach the question. Uh, then came Celtron versus Kennedy uh, and a, a, a counterpart case, uh, Janssen v. Celtron. Both of those cases involved Remicade, which is a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, ulcerative colitis, and other infirmities. And Celtron had filed an investigational new drug application, had finalized its clinical trials, but had not filed an ABLA and Sorry, I skipped over it, but Celtron was the, the biosimilar there, biosimilar applicant. Um, Celtron filed a DJ action that certain patents held by the Kennedy Trust and that had been licensed to Janssen were invalid. There, the district court dismissed the case for lack of case or controversy, finding that there was no immediate threat to Celtron. Uh, and, and specifically, the court held that Celtron improperly brought the case outside of the statutory framework of the PPCIA. Um, specifically, it didn't seek to resolve the patent issues with the RPS, the reference product sponsor. Instead, it went to the patentee. And the BPCIA provided a statutory framework that said that, that the biosimilar should have tried to resolve its disputes uh, with the RPS. And so they dismissed the case. Uh, and then the third here is Hospira v. Janssen, which uh, again involves Remicade. And in that particular case, Hospira had entered into an agreement to co-market uh, the biosimilar version of Remicade with Celtrion. Hospira filed a DJ action seeking declaratory, uh, declaratory ju judgment that certain Janssen patents were invalid. Um, Hospira, in this case, had filed its uh, Biosimilars application, the ABLA. Again, the district court dismissed the case, finding no case or controversy. In fact, that there was no injury or threat to create uh, declaratory judgment jurisdiction. Um, and in that opinion, the, the court said that past unrelated hostilities were not enough to create DJ jurisdiction. There must be a more solidified uh, adverse relationship between the parties involved. And so all of those cases were, were essentially dismissed at the district court level. Um, then there, there are additional cases uh, that we just see here on the next slide, slide six. Um, and most of these cases involve biosimilar applicants that engage in some aspect of the patent dance. They started the patent dance and didn't finish it. Um, and the questions raised are, what are the implications of only partially participating in the patent dance? Um, what provisions of the BPCIA come into play? Um, and what we've seen from these cases is whether, sorry, let me take a step back. One thing that we can decide from and have seen from these cases is that whether you participate in the patent dance or not, the courts have held that the biosimilars cannot give the notice of intent to market a biosimilar until after the FDA approves the ABLA. And we're going to discuss that in, in, in more detail in this presentation. Uh, that, in fact, is a question that is likely to go to the Supreme Court, or we expect it will go to the Supreme Court. Uh, whether the Supreme Court takes it up or not is, is an open question, but that is something that will be discussed. So we next move to two cases that present issues of first statutory interpretation, uh, that being uh, the Angen v. Sandoz case, uh, where Sandoz has filed for petition to certi for certiorari to the Supreme Court of the United States. We're waiting to see if the Supreme Court accepts that. And then the Amgen v. Apotex case. Uh, which is also uh, up uh, on a petition for cert to the Supreme Court, uh, and that is where the district court held that regardless of, of whether a biosimilar participates in the patent dance, 
they must give the notice of commercial of notice of intent to commercially market the biosimilar uh, after the FDA approves the biosimilar. Now, with respect to the Amgen v. Sandoz case, this addresses two questions. Uh, one, is the dance, the patent dance, required at all? In other words, in the statute, it reads, shall participate in the patent dance. And the Federal Circuit has held that shall means may. The question that is hopefully that the Supreme Court will answer is whether that is in fact correct. And the second question is, when can the biosimilar give notice? Uh, and and um, whether that, that notice must be given after the FDA approves the ABLA. So we're going to have a discussion uh, about those two questions in the context of the Amgen v. Sandoz case. Um, but uh, before we get into that, I want to just briefly go over the patent, the patent dance aspects of the BPCIA. Uh, the patent dance itself is a very complicated procedure. Uh, there are exchanges that have to be given back and forth between the applicant and the RPS. Um, there are confidentiality provisions that uh, come into effect in the exchange of that information. There are open questions about who can see the confidential information. Is it going to include in-house counsel? Is it going to include people who are making business decisions uh, at the various companies? Um, there are requirements to disclose detailed and validity and infringement information. The question is, how detailed is detailed? Uh, what, are the what are the consequences if the statements and the disclosures are not detailed enough? Um, and these are the issues that are going to be litigated in the coming years. Um, and hopefully we'll have at least some answers to this soon. And as we can see in the next slide, slide 10, uh, one of the provisions that I just discussed is that the biosimilar provides confidential information to the RPS. Um, and and uh, again, questions related to who uh, is allowed to see that confidential information, disputes between the biosimilars and the RPS as to the level of confidentiality, what goes into the confidentiality agreements, et cetera. And then as we can see in the next slide, um, that triggers, so what triggers district court litigation? Is it enough for a biosimilar or an RPS to not uh, participate with any one of these issues in the patent dance to trigger district court litigation? Um, and, and if not, what, what are the remedies available? And hopefully uh, we're going to dive into these issues in more detail in the context of Amgen v. Sandoz. So, um, again, the Federal Circuit's holding in Amgen v. Sandoz is that a biosimilar may choose to not participate in the patent dance provisions itself. Um, and let's just give some background on the Amgen v. Sandoz case in detail. This is the first case to make it to the Supreme Court. Uh, there is a fair chance that this case will make it. Uh, that the, sorry, that the, that the Supreme Court will, will grant cert. Um, and so I want to just discuss some of the details. Um, so uh, background is that this is a litigation that involved Nupogen. Sandoz and Angen were trying to negotiate confidentiality provision, provisions uh, in order to effectuate the exchange of biosimilar application under the BPCIA. They couldn't agree on the actual provisions of confidentiality. Um, and so as a result of that, they didn't, uh, Sandoz didn't proceed with a patent dance. Uh, when that happened, Amgen filed a DJ complaint uh, alleging that Sandoz didn't uh, follow the BPCIA disclosure procedures. 
they also, uh, Amgen also asserted state law cause of action for conversion based on Sandoz's use of Amgen's information related to safety. Um, purity and, pot and potency uh, alleged patent infringement. Um, Amgen files a motion for preliminary uh, injunction to block the commercial manufacture, use, or sale of Sandoz uh, biosimilar. And, and the point that Amgen made is the BPCIA says shall disclose the application. Amgen was interpreting that as a must requirement. Um, Amgen also took the position that Sandoz 180-day notice of commercial marketing is premature because the notice came before the biosimilar was licensed under 42, Section 262L8, and um, that Sandoz had failed to provide a copy of the application, complete package exchange information, uh, as part of the notice of commercial marketing, and that therefore uh, Sandoz was in violation of the BPCIA. Now, Sandoz clearly opposed that position, uh, and their, their counter was that there are remedies available to Amgen for failure of the biosimilars to provide the information required by the BPCIA, and that nothing in the BPCIA mandates disclosure. Uh, Amgen is still able to assert its patent and can do so immediately when the BPCIA provisions are not complied with. Um, and that the 180-day notice of commercial manufacturing does not require FDA approval. Uh, the argument there was that that would grant uh, the RPSs an extra 180 days of, of exclusivity. Um, with respect to harm, Sandoz argued that there was no irreparable harm, that Amgen had failed to show any irreparable harm, and um, that any harm that Amgen would suffer could be compensated through monetary damages and specifically through the, the, the granting of a reasonable royalty. Moving on to the next slide. The district court denied Amgen's request for preliminary injunction. <clears throat> it held that the disclosure of the biosimilar application was optional. That is, in the, in the statutory context, shall does not mean uh, mandatory, particularly where the law provides remedies for the failure to comply, that is, the, uh, the availability of Amgen to file suit. Um, it said that the 180-day notice can be provided before FDA approval, and that licensure is not required, um, and, and it did so finding that before modifies the first commercial marketing, not licensed, and, and thus uh, the notice must be given before marketing, not after licensure by the FDA. And, and then it, it bought into Sandoz's argument that uh, re requiring the, the notice of commercial marketing to be after uh, FDA licensure would essentially amount to giving the RPS an extra six months. Uh, and then with respect to the preliminary injunction, uh, the court found that any harm, any alleged irreparable harm was speculative and that they didn't provide any, no, any proof of infringement. So that case then went up on appeal to the Federal Circuit. Um, the Federal Circuit, as, as we've already previewed, found that the exchange of the patent dance procedures were optional and that the biosimilar applicant could choose to not engage in them. However, uh, it found that the 180-day notice was mandatory, at least for those applicants who opted out of the patent dance. That is, for those who decided not to participate in the BPCIA patent dance. And that notice could only be given after the FDA approved the ABLA. Um, according to the court, Sandoz opt-out did not violate the BPCIA or constitute unfair competition, leaving patent infringement as Amgen's remedy. But Sandoz's July 8, 2014 notice was ineffective because its application was, was unapproved at the time. Um, the Federal Circuit there denied rehearing, and, and importantly, the Federal Circuit did not address whether the 180-day notice requirement was mandatory for those biosimilar applicants who participated in the patent dance. That question remained unanswered. Um, a later panel in the Apotex case 
affirmed a Florida district court's decision that held that notice must be given in those cases where you do, in fact, dance as well. So uh, at least taking the uh, Amgen v. Sandoz and Apotex cases together, the 180-day notice is required whether you dance or not, and it can only be given after the FDA approves the ABLA. Now, Sandoz uh, has filed for search to the Supreme Court of the United States. It is seeking for the Supreme Court to review two issues. First, whether the notice of commercial marketing given before the FDA uh, approval is effective. And second, whether in any event it is improper to treat the notice as a standalone requirement and, and creating an injunctive remedy that delays all biosimilars for 180 days after approval. And, and really, with respect to the second point, they're raising the question of whether you have to give notice of commercial marketing under all circumstances, or are there situations where you don't have to give that notice? Um, the, the open question is, did Congress intend for this notice of commercial marketing to serve as an additional 180-day period of exclusivity? And we're all waiting to see how that question uh, is going to be answered. That's not the end of it, because Amgen decided to cross appeal, uh, and it raised its own issues, specifically whether a biosimilar applicant is required to provide the reference product sponsor with a copy of the ABLA and related manufacturing information. That is, they're asking the Supreme Court to determine whether shall means may or whether shall means mal, uh, shall, excuse me, and whether um, where the applicant fails to provide the required information, the sponsor's sole recourse is to commence a declaratory judgment under 42 U.S.C. Uh, L9C or, 20, or 35 U.S.C. 271E2C2. Now, um, the issue under number two is going to have some broader import. Uh, and that is because <laughs> If the Supreme Court decides that uh, it, where the biosimilar applicant fails to provide application, then the RPS's only recourse is to file a DJ. It's, it's possible that the RPS's are going to read that, that uh, holding expansively to say that any time the applicant fails to disclose any information, then they are able to file a DJ action under the BPCIA. Um, and the reason this becomes important is because it provides opportunities for the RPSs to perhaps game the system. Let's talk specifically about an example. Um, so the patent dance requires that the biosimilar must provide to uh, the RPS uh, a detailed statement of why the patent is invalid or unenforceable. The problem is there's no explanation in the statute as to what detailed means, uh, how detailed is detailed enough. Is it a pleading standard? Is it a contention standard that we use in district court? Is it expert report standard? Um, and right now, uh, that phrase can be interpreted many different ways. and is open to interpretation in the eye of the beholder. And you can rationalize it many different ways. Um, and just as an aside here, uh, to give you an example, in the Ab Ab v. v. Amgen case, Amgen's detailed statement of, of why it didn't infringe and was invalid was over 2,700 pages long. Um, so is that the standard that, that is going to apply for a detailed statement of invalidity and enforceability? Is it something less than that? Is it something more than that? These are all open questions uh, that that we're going to have. We're hopefully going to have answered when the Supreme Court um, takes up this case. Um, and and uh, in this particular example, depending on how the RPS interprets the statute, the RP the RPS could take the position that the applicants fail failed in their detailed disclosure and use it as an excuse to immediately file a DJ action. Um, now, whether RPSs 
choose to follow that strategy is going to depend on several factors. Uh, one is the likelihood that the biosimilar will, risk it at uh, will, will launch at risk, excuse me, the likelihood of a preliminary injunction, uh, the size of the RPS's patent portfolio, and you know you can uh, go on in lots of different permutations to try to figure out what is the right approach there. Um, one thing that I just want to take a little aside here is uh, going back to that 2,700-page chart. Um, you know, and and on the other side of that, the infringement contentions that were disclosed, I believe, were on the order of 2,400 pages. Clearly, these parties were engaged in preparing that information well in advance. This is going to be a very labor-intensive uh, exercise, at least until we get some clarity on what is required. Um, and so I think it's, it's going to be um, something that, that uh, parties on both sides of the aisle have to undertake and prepare well in advance of starting to engage in the patent dance process. Um, and so currently, we're waiting to see how these questions are going to come out. Uh, I want to just quickly show you, show you all this. This is from the Supreme Court, um, and this relates to the Amgen v. Sandoz case that on May 31st, 2016, the briefs uh, uh, from the petition for cert were distributed to the justices in advance of their conference to determine whether they were going to grant cert or not, which took place on uh, June 16th. Just four days later on June 20th, after the justices had their conference, the justices asked for the Solicitor General's view on this. Now, this, it, it, we can't predict whether the Supreme Court will grant cert, but this is certainly one indicator tending to favor that the Supreme Court is at least looking seriously at the question and is, is contemplating seriously granting cert to these types of cases, especially because it is an area of, of uh, first uh, statutory interpretation. Um, and what are the implications? The implications are far-reaching. Um, First, whether to dance or not, must we exchange, uh, what information must we exchange as part of the dance, whether the, com the notice of commercial marketing is necessary, and when is it, is it um, necessary. And all these questions really are important uh, to both sides. Um, from the biosimilars perspective, um, they want to get to market as soon as possible, and they want to do so because they are spending and incurring uh, substantial costs in developing their biosimilars. And until they actually get their products to market, they have nothing coming back in. Um, so the questions from the biosimilars perspective are, how can they expedite and maximize the chances of getting to market as soon as possible? And some of the questions that the Supreme Court's going, going to hopefully answer uh, will, will elucidate some of those questions. From the reference product sponsor, uh, side, every day that you can keep a biosimilar off the market is money in their pockets. As an example, uh, Humira is a $12 billion a year drug, a billion dollars a month. Every day that they can keep a biosimilar off the market represents big money. Uh, and whether you dance, when notice is given, um, all of these questions are going to be important in their strategy. For those of you who are in-house, and even for those of you who are, who are um, advising clients outside, um, as, as, as outside counsel, you're going to be asked these questions likely by the business sectors in, 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 at, the, at the biosimilars and at the, at the RPSs. Um, Amgen v. Sandoz is fundamental because it, it will address for the first time and likely put to rest at least some of these questions. It may raise many more questions, but it will be interesting to see how this comes out. Uh, as a final thought on this, um, what will be interesting is to see what the Solicitor General opines, uh, because uh, although, again, not predictive, more often than not, the Supreme Court has a tendency to go with the views of the Solicitor General. 
it will be interesting to see if, if that comes true here as well. Um, with that, I will uh, let everyone know that on the screen now is the CLE code for New York, New Jersey. So you've sat enough to get the code. Uh, and I will turn it over to Gwilym. Gwilym. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, very interesting. I'm now going to switch gears a little bit and start talking about IPRs in the biologic field. And um, while my discussion is largely going to focus on um, IPRs in biosimilar matters, it's also interesting to note that there are IPRs going on in uh, biologic patents, which are not in the biosimilar pathway. Uh, one, one good example of that, for example, was an, uh, a series of IPRs filed by Biomarin against Genzyme. Uh, and actually, these were filed several years ago and resulted in uh, Bio, Biomarin having found uh, or being able to prove unpatentable Genzyme's, uh, Genzyme's claims. Uh, but again, I'm going to largely focus on patents which are in the uh, biosimilar context. So what, what I have up on the screen are what I like to call the big nine. These are nine uh, very large uh, you know, biologic molecules, uh, you know, the macromolecules that are large in those terms, but also very large in terms of, of annual sales. Uh, you know the the picture of the gentleman at the bottom uh that is Dr. Kabili uh who I'm sure uh everybody knows is one of the lead inventors of the Kabili patent Kabili 2 uh which you know arguably is involved in the biologics uh industry uh, we're going to talk about uh the Kabili patents as well as these nine drugs um to some extent uh worldwide in 2014 the combined sales of these nine drugs was over $51 billion. So you can readily understand the stakes involved here. So what I've uh, shown in this, uh, in this next slide uh, really includes the annual sales of these, of these drugs, as well as when the process of IPR started for each of these. And again, as you can see, for each of these uh, nine very large selling biologic drugs, uh, there's at least one IPR been filed. Uh, some of the IPRs were filed as early as 2014, and uh, even, even this week, uh, additional IPRs have been filed, uh, for example, in the Kabili case. So we will go through uh, some of these in a little bit more detail, um, talking about you know, what lessons, if any, you can learn from the filings which have been made and also from uh, decisions which have been made. Uh, looking at this list, it's interesting to see some of the companies involved. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, Amgen is, is interesting in that it is both a, a pioneer in the biologics field, but it's also a, um, a challenger. Uh, similarly with Boehringer Ingelheim, not traditionally seen in the, in, 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 as, as a copier. Uh, the next entry actually is quite interesting and we'll spend a little bit more time talking about uh, the company Phygenix, uh, who filed an early challenge to the Herceptin patent. Uh, Phygenix was also involved in some district court litigation challenging Genentech uh, patents and also asserting some of its own. Uh, let's talk about this. Uh, in Enbrel, the, uh, the first filings was made by one of the Kyle Bass entities, uh, again, uh, which you know, introduces a different type of player uh, to, the, to the biosimilars and to the IPR world. Uh, moving down the list, uh, we see Hospira was uh, involved. Uh, Swiss Pharma International uh, filed three IPRs challenging the Cybari, uh, Cybab, Cyabri uh, drug. Uh, in the GATEX context, another Kyle Bass uh, entity, the Coalition for Affordable Drugs II, uh, was the first IPR filer. Uh, further moving down, uh, we have uh, Aventia being challenged by Momenta. And finally, uh, the first filer against the biologic Nulasta was Apotex, and that was filed just last month. So important to note that that previous slide listed the first IPR filer, 
but certainly not the only IPR filer for each of these drugs. Uh, I've tried to show on this slide uh, each party who's filed and, and how they've done so far. Uh, in the right-hand column, uh, the green font indicates uh, those filers whose uh, petition was instituted. Uh, the, red, the red font indicates uh, basically filers who were not successful at gaining institution of the IPR. So uh, for Humira, uh, Boehringer Engelheim had two, uh, two petitions where uh, IPR was instituted. Coherus had four petitions which were instituted. Amgen had two petitions which were not instituted. So you know, going down this list, you can see that uh, at least uh, based on frequency, uh, most most of these petitions have been successful at least at gaining institution. And again, uh, looking through the list, you see uh, a lot of names which are familiar, uh, some names perhaps which aren't as familiar, but uh, again, uh, no huge surprises here. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about uh, one of these IPRs that actually went all the way to final written decision. Uh, that is, it went through the entire IPR process and the PTAB uh, issued a final decision. And this, uh, th this particular IPR related to the drug Herceptin. And in this case, uh, you know, the grounds that were instituted on, and also the grounds in which uh, the PTAB held the claims not unpatentable, uh, were under 103. And as we go through these, uh, I think you'll, you, you'll note that 103, or obviousness, is the ground that is, uh, is, is really uh, the ground to go with in these cases. So, Again, the other thing we'll look at, in, in addition to the grounds which were instituted, uh, concentrate on the type of claim. This is uh, this is an immunoconjugate claim, so it's it's not a method claim, uh, it's not a formulation claim, it's uh, it's a composition claim. Uh, again, the PTAB here found the claims not unpatentable, so uh, in essence, the claims survived the process. I've included uh, further below on the slide some of the language the PTAB used in its final written decision. Uh, what is interesting about this case was first yet the, uh, the PTAB found that the claims were not obvious, but the PTAB also went somewhat out of its way, uh, tipping its hat to the secondary uh, indicia of non-obviousness arguments that the patent, o uh, patent owner presented. Um, especially uh, with regard to claim eight. Uh, if you look at these uh, these decisions, uh, the institution decisions anyway for the biosimilar uh, petitions, one thing that's pretty consistent at the institution stage, uh, the PTAB typically says that uh, they don't have enough evidence really to assess the secondary uh, considerations arguments. Uh, and usually secondary considerations does not have a huge impact on a final written decision. But again, at least for the reason that the PTAB did indicate that the secondary considerations were, uh, were powerful, uh, this case uh, is of particular interest. Okay, I'm gonna move now to, uh, to the drug uh, Humira which is one of the most heavily uh, challenged uh, drugs in the biosimilar field right now. And you will note that there are several patents, several different patents, which have been challenged uh, for Humira. And uh, this, this first slide uh, talks about the 135 patent and, uh, and specifically talks about a challenge filed by Boehringer. And here you will see uh, you know, that the instituted ground was under 103, and uh, the specific claim is to a method for treating. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Again, this is another petition uh, challenging a Humira patent. Again, on the 135 patent, but this time, uh, this time, the, 
the uh, the challenger was Coherus. Uh, again, same claim, challenged, uh, and also the instituted ground was under Section 103. On, on this slide, we see a second patent for Humira, which has been challenged in IPR. Again, the filer for this petition is Coherus, and I, I should mention the patent owner is Abvi uh, for, for these, um, you know, for, for the Humira drug. Uh, again, uh, the instituted grounds uh, were under Section 103, and again, the challenged claim uh, that, for which IPR was instituted was is method of treatment uh, type claim. Okay, uh, finally, one additional Humira patent, uh, the 987 patent in this case. Uh, again, uh, this petition was filed by Coherus. The instituted ground was, again, under 103. Uh, I hope you're seeing, uh, you're seeing the theme here. And again, challenging a method of treatment claim. So moving along uh, to uh, a second biologic drug, uh, this drug is called Gatex. And again, here we have um, two filings made by the Kyle Bass entities. Excuse me. Um, again, the instituted grounds were entirely on 103. And what you can see here is they are both formulations. Excuse me. So we have uh, in both a glucagon-like peptide 2 formulation um, <clears throat> instituted on the 103. Finally, we have um, another IPR challenging the drug Ovencia. In this case, the IPR petition was filed by the company Momenta. And similar to the last drug, um, the instituted claims under Section 103 were directed at formulations. So we mentioned earlier uh, that in addition to the IPR challenges going off the particular biologic drugs. There have also been now six uh, IPR challenges of the uh, the infamous Kabili 2 patent. Uh, uh, I think most of you will will be familiar with the Kabili 2 patent, which, due to some protracted um, interference proceedings um, at the patent office had a surprisingly long patent term, and I believe uh, the Kabili 2 patent is, is now expected to expire in about 2018. Uh, the last data I saw was that um, more than 50 uh, different biotech companies have taken licenses to the Kabili 2 patent. Um, yeah, as you see on the present slide, um, a number of companies have, have filed IPR challenges uh, to the Kabili 2 patent. Um, in each of these cases where institution was made, uh, institution was under Section 103. Um, what, what you will note, though, is that although there are six different petitions, there are only a small subset of grounds which were instituted. Um, these petitions, uh, well, the petitioners in, in these cases uh, were very uh, willing to take other parties' leads. So, so for example, with the, uh, with the second Genzyme filing, uh, they reiterated the grounds that were made in the, uh, in the first filing listed, the Sanofi Aventis Regeneron filing. So they, in essence, copied, uh, copied the, uh, the asserted grounds. Uh, that is the same story as what happened with the Mylan filing and then later with the second Merck filing. Uh, and that Merck filing was just a couple of days ago. And as you will note, um, several, of these, uh, several of these proceedings have been terminated. But uh, again, th there are several which have not yet been terminated. And, uh, and indeed, uh, the last two listed, uh, the two Merck filings, both await a decision on institution.
And finally, um, you know, while this isn't a decision that uh, that directly relates to the biosimilar pathway, uh, I wanted to end today with what I found was an interesting decision relating to the biologics and specifically uh, to the antibody space. Uh, I, I believe everybody on the phone understands that one cannot assert a ground of uh, unpatentability on the, uh, for anything except 102 and 103 grounds. Uh, and for that reason, this decision is a little unusual in that the issue that really turned the case uh, between Daiichi Sankyo and Alethea was based on a lack of written description argument in the IPR context. Uh, in this case, uh, the claims challenged really were directed to a method of using uh, a, a group of antibodies to treat bone resorption. Uh, the patent being challenged uh, had a priority claim to an earlier filed application. However, the priority application did not disclose uh, any antibodies with, uh, with, with the claimed functional properties and also failed to disclose any common structural features which would, would usually re be required to show possession of the claimed genus of antibodies. Uh, the PTAB held that because uh, there was no uh, proper entitlement to the earlier priority, uh, the priority claim failed, and as the priority claim failed, uh, there was an intermediate uh, publication that rendered the claims uh, unpatentable because of anticipation. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for attending. Uh, as I noted, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them. Uh, again, in, in the interest of time, I don't think we're going to be able to, to hit the questions which have been posted already. Uh, we will respond by email to your questions, and feel free to email us if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, also, uh, we'll be posting uh, a recording of this webinar within about 48 hours on our website, and everyone who registered for this session should receive a, a link to that website via email. If you don't get it, please let us know. And again, if you have questions uh, regarding CLE credit, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, and we will try and sort that out for you. So thank you very much, and please stay tuned for the next installment in our Biologics webinar series. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time.